So you bear with me. This cold has hung on for almost three weeks now. <clears throat> Maybe I'll lose that in the travels coming up this week somewhere, hopefully, to get rid of it. But anyhow, listen, on the screen you see this, the eight night visions uh, of Zechariah. That's what we're looking at. All in one night, he was given these visions. They were not dreams, but they were visions that were given to him. And so far, we have come through six of those. Today, we're going we're gonna to hit number seven. We'll finish out number seven. Then whenever I get back, then we'll step into number eight. But I want to go over what we've looked at so far, just to refresh your mind in these eight night visions. And they all pertain to the Jews that had returned. Remember the setting for the book. The name Zechariah means God remembers. He remembers the covenant that he had made with Abraham. And so uh, these Jews had returned from the Babylonian captivity. First, uh, the first uh, group of them was about 50,000. They came back to build the temple, they, and whenever they got back, they started out by building an altar. And they built the altar, and then they started the temple, and then once they got the temple foundation laid under the leadership of Zerubbabel, they uh, encountered opposition. Persecution came from the enemies round about because there were no walls or anything built to keep the enemy out. So the enemy had access and so they came back and they stopped or, or they, they laid the foundation and they stopped for about 15 years because of the, because of the, uh, the persecution. And so God sends Haggai and Zechariah to stir them up. Uh, Haggai is a little bit more rough than what Zechariah is, though they were both used by God. And Zechariah comes along with, with his letter to give them encouragement. And so the... Uh, the the visions that we are given are encouraging to them at least the fi the first five are the first one was the riders and the horses that talked about how god was aware that israel was in a valley and they they were in need of his assistance as they had come back the rest of the world was at ease but israel was struggling uh the jews were struggling then you had the four horns and the four carpenters or the four craftsmen and that talked about how God was going to judge the people that had judged them. And because God had raised up, for example, he had raised up the Babylonians to bring judgment on them. But the Babylonians went too far. And so God would raise up the Persians to judge the Babylonians. And then he would raise up the, the Grecians to judge the Persians and so on and so forth. But there were four carpenters and, and four craftsmen. Then there was the man with the measuring line. In Zechariah chapter 2, he was measuring Jerusalem because God was going to bless Jerusalem. And the measurement was for the, for the reason to see if the blessings, if the city would hold the blessings. And they would not hold all of the blessings. But that was encouraging to them as well. And then we had uh, the cleansing of the high priest Joshua which was uh which was very interesting that god was going to cleanse him and in a picture of that was a picture of our salvation and uh then we had the uh lampstand and the olive tree in zechariah in chapter four about how there was coming a day when when jerusalem would be the city that where everybody would come to worship at it would be the city that would represent God to the rest of the world, like God had designed, how God had originally intended it anyhow, but because of sin, that was all lost, but it would be restored. And so that would be an encouragement to all of these Jews that were building the city. And then last week, we talked about a flying scroll, and that was in chapter 5, 1 through 4. That flying scroll that was there, and, and we're not going to go back over, we're not going to read that, but the scroll was roughly about 30 feet by 15 feet. On, it was written on both sides, and it contained, on one side it contained one commandment, and on the other side it contained another commandment. One dealt with, with, uh, with falsely swearing, the other dealt with stealing. And so it was a, it was a, it was a warning to the people of Zechariah's day because some of them apparently had made a commitment to fund the temple building and they had, they had they had made vows and they had swore that they would help fund that process that that construction but along the line they instead of giving the money to the 
the building of the temple, they decided to use the money for themselves. So they were guilty of two things. They were guilty of, of uh, swearing falsely, and then they were guilty of, lo- of stealing money from God, the money that should have been his, that they were committed to, to give to him. And so this whole fly, the flying scroll, what that, the, the whole message behind it was that there was coming a day when God was going to purge the nation of Israel. And, and it was looking ahead to, uh, to a time in the, uh, at the end of the tribulation. And I use these verses because it's, it's rather eye-opening. Here's what Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 says. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, Two parts therein shall be cut off and die. That is two-thirds of the nation of Israel. But the third part shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it as my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. So there was coming a day whenever God was going to purge the nation. Today we come in, in our study to verse 5, where we're going to have a, a vision of a woman that is sitting in a basket. And then the basket's going to be picked up and carried by two other women that have wings like the wings of storks. So you see, and, the mist, and they, they're, they're, the, the basket's carried off, and the house is built for the basket in the land of Shinar, and uh, you say, what's all that about? Well, whenever we're done today, you'll understand what this is all about. So we're going to look, first of all, at the vision. So watch uh, chapter 5, 5 through 8, and then we'll break this apart. And this is where it's going to carry us over into the book of Revelation. Zechariah 5, 5, it says, Then the angel that talked with me went forth, and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what, it, what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance, or the, it, this is their appearance through all the earth, through all the land of Israel. Okay, so let me just stop for a moment at verse 6. So in the vision, he sees an ephah. That is, that would be a basket that was used for dry measuring. So that kind of gives you a hint right away that the vision is going to have something to do with commerce because that ephah was used to measure out dry goods to be able to sell them. But this basket, this ephah, is going to be a little bit bigger than what was normally used. So watch verse 7. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is the woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So the ephah, the basket's got a lid on it. The lid is made out of lead. So that tells you that it's extremely heavy. The lid is lifted up, and inside... Now, watch, if you would, uh, verse 8, because now you find out who the woman is. Watch this. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So, so let me just explain something to you here. There's a lot to consider in the midst of all of this. The woman that is in the basket is wickedness. It is wickedness personified, presented as a woman. But if you notice in verse 8, that woman desires to get out. She is pushing at the lid because when, in verse 7, whenever the lid is lifted up so that Zechariah can see what is in the basket, when the lid is lifted up, it says then in verse 8 that then he cast it into the midst of the ephah. So he takes the woman and he throws her back down in the middle of the basket, which tells me when the lid was lifted up, she was all about getting out. She wanted out of the basket, but, the, but, the, but she was cast back down into the basket and the, the, this lead lid, and it takes a lead lid to keep her in, uh, is put back on to hold her in place. So that raises the question, what is this? 
And what does it mean to these Jews that are there? Well, let me just say this. Let me give you two things to think about. And if you write any kind of notes in your Bible, you might want to write this down there. This vision is about the restraint and the removal of wickedness from the Jews is what, is it, what, it, what it is about. Okay, but there's far more to it. And in order to see that, we got to go to the book of Revelation. So I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 17, if you would. Now, as you're turning back there, I want to give you an explanation. We're going to read. I know this sounds like a lot, and this is why it's not on a screen. We're going to read all of 17 and all of 18. Because you're going to see the woman here, and, and the, the similarities are so many that I think it leaves no doubt that the woman in the basket is the same woman that you see in 17 and 18. Now, in 17 and 18 of Revelation, this woman represents three different things. Okay, so I want you to listen to this. Chapter 17, the woman is going to represent the false religious system of the world, even today that exists, but ultimately in these chapters that is going to exist in the tribulation period and is going to be destroyed. So she will represent the false religious system. She will represent a city, but she will also represent the commercial trading system that exists does today too you'll see that as we go through this you know whenever i taught the book of revelation that's been years ago now when i came back through these chapters it's like wait a minute now there's even more that i'm seeing in these verses that pertain to our day and age today and i'll show you that as we come through this so this this woman, you say, well, this, this woman that we're going to be re introduced to here in chapter 17, this is Babylon. Yeah, you're exactly right. Okay. The woman back in Zechariah 5 is wickedness. Okay, exactly right. But the tentacles of that wickedness run right through this woman that you're introduced to right here. That is what fuels this this religious system that is what fuels this the this the system of commerce that exists in our world and will exist in the tribulation period it is all driven by wickedness behind the scenes ultimately is satan and his demonic spirits that are fueling everything but it is the tentacles it is the tentacles of that that wickedness that runs through now now i want you to listen to this too there's a lot and I apologize for this. You know, I, I always say this. I got all week to study, and I have, I have uh, sometimes eight, ten hours a day pouring over this. And then I come back to you, and in 50 minutes, 50 to 60 minutes, I dump it all out and say, there you go, and expect you to be able to digest it. It takes a lot longer than that. But I will give you the high points today anyhow. So, but there's a lot more to consider here. Back in Zechariah, the woman is in the basket, and whenever she tried to get out, the lid was slammed on her. The lead lid was slammed down on her. When you come to 17 and 18, she's out. She's out. But I want you to see what she's like. And I want you to see, and we're going to connect this because Zechariah 5 is going to pull you right into these two chapters, as you will see as we go through this. But watch the verses. Let's start in verse 1 says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show, show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Okay, so just hold on for a moment. So the woman here is pointed to as a great whore, and she's sitting upon many waters. Jump over to verse 15. Let me show you the waters. If I could, just jump right over 1715. Watch this. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, okay, so this is going to translate for us, are the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay, so when you see, when you come back to 17.1, and you see this woman, and she is on, sitting on many waters, 
That means she has influenced the entire globe. So this is a global system. You understand that? This is a global system that we are seeing here over all the nations, over all the multitudes, over all the peoples. Also, I will say this. She's sitting on the waters. Also, you could say this. She had supported by the nations she is the one world religious system that will exist during the tribulation period now, let me get a little bit more detailed this is the apostate church by that i mean this before the tribulation period begins we that are the true church we that know christ as savior we're going to be raptured away we're not going to be here for the tribulation period. But there are many people that profess themselves to be Christians who are not, and they're going to be left behind, and they're going, they going to make up the apostate church. Now, I'm going to tell you what I believe and why I believe this, and, and I, I want to say this. My words are not to offend you. It is my desire, and it is my responsibility to teach you the truth straight up. I firmly believe, and I'll back this up with these verses, this is the Roman Catholic Church. That is the apostate church. That is the, that is the religious organization that is going to function during the first half of the tribulation period for three and a half years. And I'll show you what happens to her at the midpoint here in a moment. Verse 2, watch it. With whom the kings of this earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk, with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet colored beast, full of name, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. That's the Antichrist. Okay, so so she's sitting on the Antichrist. Okay, so now listen to this. That means that she is supported by the Antichrist. Here's what you got to understand. In the first part of the tribulation period, in that first three and a half years, the Antichrist will support this apostate church, this false worship system. Let me go further with that statement. With the mother-child cult that started clear back in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. We've been talking about that in, uh, in, in our study on the kingdom. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11, that's where Nimrod and his wife Samaris had a child named Tammuz and the uh, fellow by the name of Hyssop did a lot of research on that and, and tradition says that their son was killed and that he was resurrected from the dead and everybody began to worship this mother-child cult which then when God, when God scattered everybody at the Tower of Babel, that mother-child cult was carried out into all the world. And I gave you a chart on Sunday nights that showed you how the different areas of the, of the world, how they have adapted to, or they had adapted to that over the years, but you bring it right down to Roman Catholicism, and it's Mary and Jesus. It's that mother-child cult. It's the same thing. You're going to see this woman's going to end up right back where she started, right back at Shinar, which is the land of Babylon. Okay, same place. Okay, but the Antichrist is going to support this system. The Antichrist is going to support this apostate church for this reason. Because this apostate church, once the tribulation begins and people begin to get saved, and many of them will through the witness of the two the the two witnesses of revelation 11 and then you have the the 144,000 jewish men that are going to be missionaries many people are going to get saved and so this false worship system right here that is supported by the antichrist is going to be used to persecute the true believers watch revelation 6 9 through 11 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. See that? They're slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are true believers. These are people in the tribulation that are going to be, ma- that are going to be martyred. Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season. And their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So one of the ways that these true believers are going to be killed are going to be through this false worship system that exists. That's why the Antichrist supports this system, because he hate, he's going to hate true believers. And anybody that is a follower of those two witnesses of Revelation 11 or those 144,000 men. So this woman, this system is going to be used to persecute and actually kill true believers during the tribulation period. Watch verse 4 of Revelation 17. And a woman was arrayed in, watch the, watch, watch in this verse, watch the amount of value in this system. Watch the, the worldly value. Watch the money. It says, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman, watch this, drunken with the blood of the saints. See that? See how she is used by the Antichrist to kill the true believers that come to know Christ during the tribulation period. She slaw- they slaughter him. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, see that? And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now watch this one. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Let me explain that. This is the Antichrist. Okay, watch the verse again. The beast thou sawest was, he lived, is not, he died, and ascended out of the bottomless pit. He was resurrected. He will be, remember I told you, whenever we studied Revelation, and I've said this many times, the Antichrist will be a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. So Satan is going to use him to counterfeit the resurrection. But it's interesting here in this verse because it says he will ascend out of the bottomless pit. What's that mean? That means this, I believe, that Satan at this point is going to indwell this man. This is when the true character of this individual is going to show forth. We'll get to that in a moment the end result and go into perdition oh, let me keep reading and the, they that dwell on the earth shall wonder is that any i mean that should not surprise you whose names were not written in a book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is the resurrection of the beast is gonna is gonna be something that is gonna cause many people to follow the antichrist you can only imagine can you imagine just just thinking about this, if a, if a world leader died and they, they laid him out, uh, I, I just used, remember whenever the Pope died? you remember back whenever the Pope died and they, they laid him out and all those people filed by and they kept coming and coming? Can you imagine what would have happened if he would have sat up? If he'd have sat up, got out of the coffin and walked around, they would have followed him anywhere. Case in point, right here. What are they going to do? They're, they're going to they're gonna know that the, that the Antichrist receives, according to Revelation chapter 13, a deadly head wound. You get a deadly head wound, let me tell you what happens. You die. There's no two ways about it. A deadly head wound is going to kill you. Okay, so he's going to get a deadly head wound. He's going to die. He's going to be resurrected. The whole world is going to wonder. 
When I say the whole world, I say except for those that know Christ as Savior. They will not buy into this. They will not buy into this. But let me go on. There's more here. Verse 9. And here's the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Stop. Remember what I said to you that I said I believe that this is a Roman Catholic church. Rome is known as the city on seven hills. I believe right there you have it. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Right out of Rome. Right out of Rome. Going back, going right back to where it all started with the false worship, as you'll see as we go on. Watch this. I'm not going to get into these kings uh, because I knew that I would be I would be running out of time. Somebody said, boy, we're going to be done early today. I said, oh, just hold on. There's a lot to cover in these chapters. Watch verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven and goeth unto perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Okay, now watch this. Which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So these are the ten kings that are going to join up with the beast during the tribulation period. Now I want you to, I point that out because I want you to see what happens now. Watch this. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So they'll be committed to the Antichrist, the world ruler. These shall make war with the Lamb. That's Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now watch this. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast. Remember, they're ten kings. Watch what they do. These shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and shall burn her with fire. Stop. What's that about? These ten kings that are sold out to the Antichrist are going to devour the apostate church. Why in the world is that? Why would they do that? Because the Antichrist is using the apostate church to thin out, to, to exterminate true believers. That's the midpoint of the tribulation. And the reason that this is happening, they are sold out to the Antichrist. They'll, they'll do whatever he asks them to do. You've got to understand that back in verse 8, he ascended out of the bottomless pit. He's indwelt by Satan. He's indwelt by Satan. And so now we're at the midpoint of the tribulation period. And these 10 kings are going to destroy that apostate church because Satan can't have any kind of worship come into that church. He wants it all for himself. He wants it all for himself. Let, let me... Uh, let me give you a few verses. How about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 and 4? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The, the day of the Lord. The, the day that the, be, the beginning of the, uh, the tribula whenever the tribulation begins. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now watch what it says about the Antichrist. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see what he's going to do? He's going to set himself up in the temple and claim to be God. Watch Matthew 24, 15 through 21. This is midpoint. Verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. That's when he sets himself up in the temple and claims to be God. Watch how bad it gets. And let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. 
Let, let him which is in the, on the housetop not come down to take, a, take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither, neither on a Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no, nor ever shall be. Now that Matthew 24 is, that's all Jewish. That's not talking to you and I as the church. This is all Jewish. Matthew 24 and 25. Don't forget that. It'll help you to keep things straight here. So what he says here, that there'll be great tribulation like there never was before, because that's when the Antichrist is going to set himself up to be God, and he is going to turn upon the nation of Israel to destroy that nation that's his desire why we've talked about it because the promise of the kingdom and the promise of the earthly return of christ is made to the nation of israel not to the church and so he believes if he can eliminate the nation of israel jesus won't come back he won't set up the kingdom and so satan can rule the world forever let me give you a couple more uh daniel nine twenty seven says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, that's the midpoint, the, that's a week of years, that's three and a half years deep, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Daniel twelve eleven. watch this verse, if you would, and from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away that's the midpoint and the abomination that maketh desolate set up okay the antichrist gonna then and the, the image of the antichrist gonna be set up in the temple okay watch this i just want to comment on the end of this there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days now if you are a bible scholar and you run the numbers on this you'll you'll say this wait a minute 1,290 days is 30 days beyond three and a half years. That's exactly right. 1,260 days is three and a half years. So why does it say 1,290 days? What I thought the tribulation was seven years long. It is. You say, okay, then what are the extra 30 days at the end? Probably the establishment of the kingdom and you have a judgment to take place in there. That's Matthew 25 in the judgment of the nations. So there will be things that will occur after the tribulation, after Jesus returns, that will no doubt be absorbed into those 30, into that 30 day period. Let me finish. Let's go back to Revelation 17. Let me finish this. Verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts, that's the, that's those, those 10 kings to fulfill his will, that's to destroy, his will is to destroy the apostate church and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So remember I told you, she is a, she is a system. She is a religious system. There in verse 18, you find out that she's also a city. That, let me go back because I've got you clear away from Zechariah, but stay here because I'm going through Revelation 18 too. That wickedness uh, that is in that basket is running rampant through this woman. Same woman, I believe. Same woman. If you look, she's sitting in a basket. Here she's sitting, she's sitting down. The names are very similar that are given. I believe you have the same woman. You can... Uh, there are many scholars that believe that Hitchcock is one of them that'll give you all the parallels with those. I didn't want to get into that this morning. But anyhow, it is a false religious system, and it is a city. But you come to chapter 18, and it is also the commercial system that, it, that will exist. Now listen, not just in the tribulation, but even today, even today, Watch, let me walk you through some of this. Start in chapter 18 again, or uh, now. Okay, watch them. Verse 1, And <clears throat> after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. 
And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become, now watch this, the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Stop. Many times in the Bible, birds are portrayed as demonic spirits. Watch the parable of the sower, Matthew 13. We'll get in, we're going we're to get into this in our study of the kingdom when I return from the West. But it says this, Matthew 13, 3 and 4 and then 18 and 19. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Now you, have the, now you have the interpretation. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which is sown in the heart. So in the parable of the sower, the birds are symbolic of demonic spirits. Same thing right here. The same thing. It's the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful Bird, but let me tell you, let me just say this there, there is just so much here. The wickedness that exists in the, in the commerce of today, in the, in the commercial system, the love of money, the love of money being the root of all evil, but in the midst of it, it is a trap. You see that? It's the hold of every foul spirit in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's why God tells us not to, the, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Okay, because the, the whole commercial system, and I know you've got to go to work, and I know that you have to, you have to buy things, and, and some of you are business people. Nothing wrong with that at all. But you've got to be careful, because there is, there, there is, this, is a, this whole system is like a trap, and many people get into the world system and they get entrapped in there, and you can say whatever you want to them, and it's like if they don't hear a word. They are so caught up in the whole commercial system and trying their best to make more and more money that they don't understand what they're, that they're even in a trap. Let me go on with this. Verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have com committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That's what you see today, just an increase in wealth. I have no problem with capitalism. I, I think it's great. You know, people can open up a business, you can open up a business, and you can, you can make money, and, and you can go on. As long as it's done properly, this, a lot of what is here is not. Let me go on, verse 4. And I heard another voice out of heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Watch, even God's people get trapped into this. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath fulfilled to fill her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment sorrow give her for she saith in her heart i sit a queen and am no widow and shall no more sorrow therefore shall her plagues come in one day death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire uh, for strong is the lord god who judgeth her in one day the world's commercial system is going to crash you know, people talk about the, the whole system collapsing today. <clears throat> you go what, whichever direction you want with that. But I'll say this. During the tribulation, this system is going to be functioning. So if it would crash today, it's going to have to get back up and get running. And it's also going to have to change locations. Because this is Babylon. This center here, you're going to see the, the destruction of it in a moment because I want you to see what goes on in it. This is Babylon. So today, Wall Street is kind of the center. It's going to have to switch somewhere along the line 
whether Wall Street collapses and it gets restarted in Babylon, whatever. I don't know. Or whether this system continues and it just transfers over once the world ruler comes. And the United States isn't the superpower that it once was. And it, and it kind of gets absorbed into everything else. Maybe that's when it'll get transferred over. But anyhow, let me go back to verse 9. Let me continue down to verse 9 now. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city for one hour is thy judgment come. See, it's all going to crash at the end. Verse 11, I'll, I'll, I'll show you something interesting here whenever we get to the end of this chapter. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. See how locked into this they are? You, whenever you look at when this is happening, it, when I started chapter 17, that if you noticed, it was one of the angels to come out to speak with John that had one of the seven vials. That, those vials at the, are the end of the tribulation. By this time, over half of the world's population has died. You would think that instead of being wrapped up in commerce and buying and trading and making more money, that they'd be thinking about eternity. But that's not their concern because back in this very same chapter in verse 2, I told you it's a trap. It is a trap. It is a, it is a trap people fall into and it blinds them. And they're all concerned and, and their heart's broken, not for people that have died, but their heart's broken because they can't sell their merchandise. And they can't make money. If you want a glimpse of that, all you got to do is look towards the elites of today. You, you see it all the time. Anyhow, the, boy, I could say a lot, but I'm done. Verse 11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Now watch this. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and fine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and watch the last two slaves and souls of men remember I said now here we are years later going through this not in detail like we did whenever we studied it but you know what came to my mind there human trafficking the slaves and the souls of men that's going to be going on it's going on now by the way it's going on now kids that are sold by uh, taken and sold and child trafficking and things that I could tell you about that would if I told you you wouldn't get any of the rest of the message because you wouldn't be able to get your mind off of the image that had been etched in your mem in your mind by what I told you of what goes on with these kids and what is happening and so I say this, while we need to do all we can to stop that, I believe that it's only going to escalate as time goes on. Remember, right now, wickedness is still in the basket. When this hits, she's out. She's out. I'll get to that in a moment, if I don't run out of time. Verse 14, And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed, from thee and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all and the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for fear of her torment weeping and wailing and saying alas alas that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for for in one hour so great riches has come to naught in one hour it falls and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors as many as trade by sea stood afar off and they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning saying what is the what what city is like unto this great city and they cast dust upon her heads and cried 
weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Isn't that amazing that they weep for that city and cast dust on their heads, which is a sign of repentance, but they won't repent of their sins. Their hearts are broken, not because of the people that are destroyed and because of where they're going, but their hearts are broken because they can't make their riches anymore. And do you not see that today? You know, I am, I am taken back many times by people in our government that are, listen, I say this kindly but truthfully, that are up in years, that are up in years, and, and it's like all they do is grab for more. And they don't care who they step on. They don't care what they do to get it. They just want more. They will lie. They will cheat. They will steal. They will do so many deceptive things to get more. And, and I've said this to many people. I look at those individuals and I say, do they think they're going to live forever? Do they never even stop to think that one day they will die and they will stand before the Lord? Apparently that is not even a thought because they were caught in this trap. That's what Satan does. He will blind you to the, with the lust of the flesh so that you don't even think about eternity. And then you harden your heart so much and you get to the point where maybe you ought to. And I, I'll go back to something that's said in Proverbs, you go beyond remedy. It's pretty frightening. Verse 20, watch what happens now. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets. For God hath avenged her, avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the city of Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. The voice of the harpers and musicians, the pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman and whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, see that? For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. I think you find it interesting if you work, look up that word sorceries. I think that's the very word we get our word pharmacy from. It's kind of like this whole system is a drug, an intoxicating drug. Verse 24, and in her was found the blood of the prophets, of the saints, and of them that were slain upon the earth. You see what the end of that right there, you see what happens, or you get a glimpse into it. Anybody that stands up against this system, they're slaughtered. Are we not seeing that today? Let me, let me just ask you that question. You don't have to answer. But whenever you get people that want to stand up for what is right today, they are basically laughed to scorn, aren't they? Somebody that wants to stand up against abortion, you know, and say that this is wrong, well, right away, you're against women's rights. And then, oh... There's just so much, just so much. But you can see all of this, even in our day today, you know, what's going on. We're headed for verse 24, by the way. The world is, we aren't, but the world is. And, and you don't know how far it's going to go before, before the Lord returns. Now come back to Zechariah, okay? So I got you through that. Uh, now I got to figure out where I'm at on my paper. Okay, so I want to go back, and I'm going to talk now in Zechariah 5, real quick here, because we're running out of time, about the restraint. Watch 7 and 8 again of Zechariah 5. It says, to Behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is the woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah, and, and, and he said, This is wickedness, and he cast it in the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth there. So that lid's got to represent something. And, and, and let me, there, there are just so many things here to consider. The fact that she's just wanting to get out. He's, when the lid's lifted, she's coming out. And he casts her back down in that. 
and he slams the lid back on. Can you not sense in our world today that she's trying to get out of the basket? Have you ever, have you noticed that? That it's like wickedness is just busting to get loose. And it's, it's like after this last, uh, the, the last presidential election, and it didn't matter who got elected. I'm not saying that. I'm not siding with anybody. But it's like a little bit more of that lid got cracked open. And now you're seeing more and more and more of this wickedness. But she's still trapped. Why is she trapped in our day? Because of you and I. Watch 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, but that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That's the removal of the church. We talked about that. And a man of sin be revealed, a son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that, that is worshipped, so, that, he, so that, as, that as God, so he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and here it comes, only he who now, he who now letteth, that word letteth there means restrains, only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So there is a person that is restraining wickedness from coming on a scene, and that person is this Spirit of God that lives within you and I, the church. The church, we are called salt and light of the world. And so, therefore, we are preservative, but once the church is gone, wickedness will no longer be restrained. And so, then you go back to Zechariah's day, and you say, well, the church didn't exist back there. So, what was restraining the wickedness back there? I think the same spirit. Watch Genesis 6, 1 through 3. It says, and it, shall, it came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. In Noah's day, there was a, there was a restraining power of the spirit even in that day also. And so right now, this wickedness that is in the basket in our day in Zechariah's day it was restrained in our day it is being restrained however it is constantly pushing to get out watch uh, Zechariah 9 through 11 I'll finish this out for you then lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold there came out two women and the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Now let me stop. I read a lot about those women uh, and who they are. Some say they are demonic spirits. Some say they are angels. But angels wouldn't need the wings of storks. They got their own wings. The bottom line is we don't know who they are. I don't think they are demons because if they are demons, they would let her out. They would let her out. That's their desire. Let's let her out. Let's get her out and turn her loose on the face of the earth. But they're going to pick up this ephah, and they're going to carry it. Watch verse 10. They lift it up between the earth and the heaven, so they're flying with it. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? Where, where are they going? Where are they going? Now watch this. And he said unto me, to build it a house. Now stop. You see that word house right there? That is the very word that is used for Solomon's temple. To build it a temple. Where at? In the land of Shinar. Aha. That takes my mind back to Genesis chapter 10 and 11. That's where Nimrod's kingdom was. That's where the Tower of Babel was built. That's where the mother-child cult all began. The false worship system that poisoned the entire world 
And then God had to come from out of that. He pulled Abraham out, and he said to Abraham, I will make of thee a new nation, a nation that's not been polluted by this mother-child worship, and through you and through this nation, I will bring about the kingdom that we are studying on Sunday nights. But this, this woman is carried to Shinar. And by the way, Shinar is also Babylon. It's also Babylon, which is what we read about back in Revelation. It's all going to end up right back where it started from. But the thing is that there's going to be a temple that is going to be built for this woman of wickedness. It says, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. There will be a center in the city of Babylon where wickedness will flow out of. That's, what we, that's that religious system. That's that commercial system. That's that city that at the end of Revelation chapter 17 that John was talking about. So, coming back to this, I ask this question. What's it all mean to the Jews? What's it all, what's that, what's it mean to these individuals that are building the temple? Well, I think it means this. That you better get building because right now God is restraining the wickedness. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to work through what they were working through when in dealing with the opposition and the threats that were coming. It's difficult to deal with that. But there's coming a day whenever things are going to be a lot worse. And so while God's restraining this wickedness, you need to do all that you can. What's it mean to you and I today? Same thing. Same thing. Life can be difficult today. People can be difficult to deal with. But we've got to understand that there is a restraint on the wickedness of the world. People can only go as far as what God permits them to go today. That's it. But there is coming a day whenever the restrainer will be removed. The, the restraints will be taken off the demonic world as we looked at in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Satan and his demonic spirits are going to have far more reign. And we can't even begin to imagine what that is going to be like. But I will say this. Today, we are blessed with the restraints being upon the wicked world. And so that gives to you and I an opportunity not to build a temple, but to be used by God to build the church. That's what is presented to you and I today. Now's the time to serve. Now's the time to get busy. And I could, I could do a lot with that. I could bring that back to our, even to our nation. And I could say this, we have it so easy compared to the early church. On Wednesday nights, we're studying the Sermon of Stephen. At the end of that sermon, Stephen is a transitional man. That sermon will be what causes the persecution to come that will launch the gospel from Jerusalem out into the uttermost parts of the world. But in order to get that done, Stephen's going to be stoned. Can you imagine being stoned to death? Can you imagine if they drug you out to the outskirts of town and, and they said that they were going to stone you to death? It wouldn't be bad if the first guy that threw a stone was pretty accurate and he hit you in the head and knocked you out. But chances are the first guy that throws a stone is going to be somebody that hits you in the stomach or something. Or maybe in the kneecap. And so then they're going to they're gonna pummel you with stones. But I'd, can you imagine knowing that that's the way you were going to die? Till you were pummeled with stones and died. We don't face any of that today. We don't face any of that. Those guys would come back here and they'd say, boy, you people are soft. You're soft. You know, that, this is easy. You have all the opportunities in the world, the open doors and, and, and everything. And so we need to do all we can. That's the bottom line.
There's a lot to be done. There's a lot of people that need Christ as Savior. There's a lot of people that are caught up in, in Revelation 17 and in Revelation 18 in the religious system, the false worship system of the world, and they're caught up in the, in the, fall, in the, in the uh, commerce of the world, the, the uh, trading system of the world. They're caught up in that. They're in a trap. They're, they're, they're stuck. And that's all they can think about. And that's why we're left here to tell them that there's a way to escape all of that and be forgiven of every sin that they've ever committed in their life, and that's to come to Christ. That's what we're here for. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for what we are able to see. Lord, as we look at the woman that was in the ephah, Lord, and seeing that it is wickedness personified, and then to go to Revelation 17 and 18 and to see Lord, the culmination of that, basically, that woman in Zechariah 5 will be carried off and there'll be a temple built. That was that temple that we, that city that we talked about, Babylon, back there in Revelation 17 and 18. But Lord, from there, the wickedness will flow through the worship system of the tribulation, through the commerce, through the commercial system. Lord, we see it today. We see it even today, while wickedness just is pushing as hard as she can to get out, and the, while there is still wickedness in the world, it's still not to the extreme that it will be when the tribulation comes. Lord, we are blessed with the days that we live in. Lord, might we use each one of these days to make them count for you. Lord, uh, stir our hearts, we pray. Use the message to accomplish your purpose and your will. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Take your hymnals, turn to number 26. In closing, rejoice, ye pure in heart. We'll stand and sing verses 1 and 5, number 26.